So now if we go back into. Well, yeah, if we open the PowerPoint. I can just watch this. But if we go to the back to the PowerPoint now and open the PowerPoint up. And then, yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. <laughs> Yeah. All right, let's get started, everyone. All right. Oh, that's really loud. <laughs> Our two speakers today are both uh, students of Professor Palawa. Our first speaker is Christopher Barr. Chris completed his undergraduate degree in ECE at the University of Illinois, and he is currently working towards a master's degree under Professor Palawa. His research is focused on algorithms and hardware for PV maximum PowerPoint tracking. Prior to beginning coursework in engineering, Chris completed an associate's degree in applied technology, and when he's not involved in academic pursuits, he enjoys applying his technical aptitude to various hands-on projects, including automotive and small engine repair. Well, thanks for the opportunity <laughs> to stand in a tunnel with you all and talk about dithering digital ripple correlation control with digitally assisted window sensing for solar photovoltaic maximum PowerPoint tracking. It's a very appropriate title for the paper, but should probably be shortened for the presentation. But uh, basically, this is a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, just a very, very quick review of what PV maximum PowerPoint tracking is, and more specifically, how PWM resolution affects our maximum PowerPoint tracking capability. Um, I'm going to review the dithering digital ripple correlation control, which I've talked about previously and is based on Professor Krein's work. Uh, then I'm going to talk about how uh, we use a, a windowed ADC measurement technique. And uh, then finally, I'll show how we apply this measurement technique to the maximum PowerPoint tracking algorithm and uh, achieve some, some impressive results. So first of all, maximum PowerPoint tracking. Um, as we know, the PV, the power, the IV curve of a photovoltaic panel is nonlinear. And so what that does is it gives us a, a, a maximum PowerPoint or a value of current and voltage in which the panel power is maximized. And clearly, you know, if we change our panel current in either direction of this IMPP, our power generated through the panel drops off. So in order to operate at this panel maximum power point, we need fairly good control over the converter, which in a, in a switching uh, rate, uh, power converter, our control resolution is determined by our duty ratio re resolution. And so, which is basically just the, the, the resolution which with, with which we can adjust the duty ratio of the converter. Now, this in turn is limited by the clock frequency of our microcontroller in, in applications where the buck converter is being controlled by a microcontroller. And so what we come up with is this relationship whereby if we're switching at a high speed or if the microcontroller is running at a low speed, we have a fairly coarse control resolution on our converter. And what this will cause us to, to do is to jump back and forth around the maximum power point without being able to nicely focus in on and operate at the maximum power point. As you know, um, Perturb and Observe is one tool to check, track the maximum power point, one algorithm. And basically, in this approach, the duty ratio is simply adjusted, and the change in power is evaluated with each adjustment. And basically, depending upon the, the change in power that resulted from the previous adjustment, um, the next adjustment will either progress in the same direction or reverse directions. I 
I lost it. Okay. So what can we do about this coarse duty ratio resolution? Well, one approach that's commonly used is dithering. And what dithering allows us to do is to operate between the extreme points at which our native PWM duty ratio re resolutions would place us. So here we're operating at a high duty. Our panel voltage falls, our panel current rises. And then when we switch back to a low, du low duty, the panel voltage falls and the current panel voltage rises and the current falls. But if we quickly dither back and forth between these two duty ratios, we can see that the current and voltage never reach the native steady state values, but instead we're able to adjust this ripple in between the limits that would be imposed by a coarse duty ratio resolution. Now, this does cause this deals with our control resolution problem, but it also causes other problems, and that is basically we end up trading off control resolution for tracking speed. And so what happens is in a typical power converter, we need to wait several switching cycles after change in duty ratio before we can reevaluate our maximum power point tracking algorithm. algorithm. When we're dithering, we need to wait, wait several dithering cycles, uh, depending on the converter slew rate, for the converter to arrive at a new steady state ripple. And this is basically a filtered panel voltage, which is what our actual control will be based upon. And we can adjust this time constant of this filter so that this filter exactly tracks uh, the average magnitude of the, of the panel voltage. However, there as well, as we decrease the time constant of the filter, we're allowing the filter to ripple more during these, these dithering intervals. And again, that's, that's decreasing our tracking effectiveness. So with, this, with these constraints, our, we, we had this clear trade-off between resolution and tracking speed. But then you could ask the question, is it really necessary to wait for the converter to reach steady state? Well, for P&O, perturb and observe it is. But for um, dithering ripple correlation control, I'm going to show you where that we can immediately reevaluate the maximum power point tracking algorithm after every dithering cycle. So DDRCC, or the Dither digital, Dithering Digital Ripple Correlation Control Algorithm, is based on Professor Krein's work on ripple correlation control and some of Jonathan Kimball's work uh, as well. And what it does is it just takes into consideration this ripple that we have in panel voltage and current. Now, if we correlate these two plots, we can see that as we dither, this change in, in current causes us to transverse the, the PI curve of the panel. And so if we sample measurements carefully at the right interval, we can actually determine where we are on this plot. And because this happens every dithering cycle, we can immediately determine where we are on the plot without waiting for the converter to come to a steady state equilibrium. So basically, we'll know where we are at each interval as the converter moves to its new equilibrium. So exactly how do we uh, accomplish this, this control technique? Well, it's based on the derivative of power with respect to current at the maximum power point. Because it's a, it's a peak there, we have a derivative of 0. Now, we, we accomplish the change in voltage and current uh, with respect to time. So obviously, power also changes with respect to time. So we break this, this fraction up into the product of two fractions. And these are both uh, derivatives with respect to time. And then we can see that depending upon the, pro the sign of this product, so if we're over here and we increase current and time and power increases in time, this product is positive, And that indicates that we're at some i less than i MPP. Now, if we're over here and we increase current, di dt is positive, dp dt is negative, And that tells us that we're at some i higher than the maximum power point i. So by performing a, an integral control on the product of these, these ratios and applying a, a gain, 
we can converge to the average duty ratio at, least at which we want to run our converter. So we're not going to be performing integrals in an you know, 8 or 16-bit microcontroller that we're going to use for maximum PowerPoint tracking. So we, we evaluate that integral in a discrete form. And what this basically tells us is that by iteratively taking the sign of the difference in power between p equals 0 and p, uh, sorry, t equals 0 and t equals rdtd, if we evaluate this iteratively, we'll converge to the optimal uh, duty ratio, or the DMPP. So now we've addressed the issue of control resolution and tracking speed. And there, this, this, it sounds great, but when we actually go to implement, there are some challenge, challenges. And specifically, I'll draw your attention to this, this delta I here, or the delta V here. Now, these, this dithered uh, voltage and current ripple is sitting on top of a much larger signal. So if we're going to set up our microcontroller and our, our analog inputs to our microcontroller ADC to measure this signal, we're going to have to scale our, zero, for instance, 0 to 5 amp input signal into the microcontroller ADC. So just to reiterate that, basically, as the panel current changes from 0 to the maximum power of the panel, uh, that all has to fit into the 0 to 2.5 range of the ADC. So our input amplifiers will scale this all into that 2.5 volts. Now that sounds nice until you realize what actually happens in a low-cost microcontroller when you're sampling. Uh, what this is, is this is a high-precision high uh, sweep of test current. And these are the values, these are the readings that were yielded by an Agilent multimeter and the unwindowed MSP430 ADC. And what you have here is just random noise. Uh, there's a couple source of this, sources of this. There's the microcontroller clock, clock itself, which couples into the ADC and can produce ripple. And there's also, obviously, the, the uh, EMI of the converter itself. Now, this test was actually done with a converter not running. So this is, this is mostly the microcontroller itself with the addition of any noise that might be coupled in through the amplification circuit. And what we see here is that we have a 25 milliamp uh, noise fluctuation. And this is really going to make it impossible to measure the small delta i that we need to for maximum PowerPoint tracking using DDRCC. And we have a similar problem with voltage, although it's not quite as significant because of the way the, the voltage is measured with in, as opposed to current. So what we're going to do with this signal is we're going to um, we're going to take basically a smaller sweep of this of this full current range at a time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to window our full current range into the microcontroller ADC. So what this, by windowing, this basically what I mean by windowing is we're going to uh, take this basically almost negligible signal from the sense resistor that's measuring current at the input of the, of the power converter. And we're going to amplify it up till the ripple magnitude is reasonable, till the ripple magnitude fills a measurable, significant uh, percentage of our ADC range. And then, because as you can see, this will put us up near 80 volts, way outside the range of our 2.5 volt microcontroller, we're going to shift that signal down into the range of 0 to 2.5 volts. And so this obviously, you know, because our op amps are running at 5 volts, this, isn't, this is not performed sequentially. Instead, we have a circuit that performs this functionality, where we have the vSense that's multiplied by some gain from that subtracted a v, v bias multiplied by some gain, and that gives us this amplified and scaled signal. Shivan, would you mind?
And then, um, as I'm sure you picked up on, uh, basically this window will move, will be moved as the current through the controller changes, or through the converter changes. So as the sun comes out and the panel is able to produce more power, the current will rise and our window will rise up with it so that we achieve this nice ratio of uh, microcontroller ADC input range to the ripple at the M to the ripple signal into the ADC. Now, what does this allow us to do theoretically? What we're basically doing is we're taking the full range of the ADC and we're focusing it on these little intervals. So here I have this very hypothetical 4-bit ADC. That's going to give us 16 discrete values we can divide our current signal into. But if we compress these into a small fraction of the full range that we need to measure, we basically scale our ideal resolution by the number of windows we divide into. Now, how do we accomplish this in hardware? Well, this is our microcontroller. Um, this is our microcontroller. This is a representation of our amplification and windowing circuit. And uh, we measure the panel voltage just using a voltage divider and panel current by measuring the voltage across the sense resistor. And then again, this is the conceptual depiction of what we're going to be doing. We accomplish this using uh, two different circuits. We actually window both the current and the voltage. This is the voltage circuit. This is the current circuit. Because of the ranges that the voltage operates over, the voltage operates from, from some 50% of open circuit voltage to 100% of open circuit voltage. Basically, we don't need to go down to zero. So we bias this a little bit differently than we bias the current, which goes from zero to full, you know, the full short circuit current of the panel. Uh, but basically, these bias voltages are filtered voltages from the PWM, an extra PWM channel in the microcontroller. And what this setup does is it allows us to amplify this small signal, this small signal range, to fill the full range of the microcontroller ADC. And then we shift this full range up and down as the current changes. Now, I'd like to point out uh, much to hopefully Andrew's pacification or delight, that we're able to use this technique because of the, uh, because of the application. So as I showed you before, we're trying to measure that small voltage and current ripple. We can accept some loss of accuracy in the DC level of that ripple. What we really need is high accuracy in the ripple measurement. So basically what I'm saying is that we do lose some absolute DC accuracy in the measurement because of non-linearities and non-idealities in this, in this circuit. Also, the circuit should obviously change between converters and that type of thing. But in exchange for giving up a little bit of DC accuracy, we're able to achieve high precision uh, measurements of the ripple signal. So what's the end result? Uh, this is the same test with the current, the current uh, window set to 1 32nd of the full, roughly 1 32nd of the full current range. And by windowing the current signal in that way, we're able to make the relative, mi minimize the damage, if you will. We're able to uh, minimize the relative noise that comes into the uh, microcontroller ADC. And then we just append these measurements end to end. And as, we, as the current into the converter changes, uh, this gives us some decent resolution over the whole zero to short circuit current range of the panel. So this looks pretty. What do, can we evaluate this a little bit more quantitatively? Uh, this is not a discussion on um, signal, you know, signal assessment, noise assessment. All I'm doing is going to quickly show you that, that yes, in fact, this, this approach does help us. Uh, basically, the, we, there's a characteristic for ADCs called noise-free code resolution. Um, and this is different than the effective number of bits. The effective number of bits are the ENOB that you frequently hear about in ADC specs. That's an AC specification. 
So the noise free code resolution is a DC specification. And because we're taking these samples at certain points in the signal, we really are interested in a noise, yeah, in a DC measurement. So theoretically, uh, we, but if we window or if we don't window, if we measure the whole current signal with one setting of the ADC, we could achieve 4.9 milliamps of measurement resolution for a five amp range. But in reality, uh, this, this value is, or this resolution is decreased uh, significantly by the distribution of noise that we have at the, um, at the input of the ADC. And if you work through this, basically, based on this sample data, you could say that rough, roughly we're going to have about 31 uh, milliamps of resolution uh, using a full range setup. Now, if we window, what we're actually doing is we're taking this noise that's this full noise here that's basically from the circuit and from the microcontroller itself, and we're compressing it into a small region around the measurement point. So obviously, we're not getting rid of it. And in fact, we may be coupling in a slightly more noise because we have a little bit more amplification. But because it's in this small, this small constrained range, uh, we're able to deal with it because, like I showed you in that plot, it's less significant in the total measurement spectrum. So if we apply the same analysis, we get about an 8x improvement in our noise-free resolution. Um, and we come out with an effective number of bits of 10.3. Uh, and this is a 10-bit 10, 10 ADC. So this is basically just what you'd expect when you purchase the ADC. So what we effectively did was we took out the, the consequences of that noise. And again, this is because we're less interested in the DC component of our measurement, and we want to obtain a high precision measurement of the AC ripple. So this is pretty, uh, but did it actually work for our maximum PowerPoint tracking? Um, the answer is yes. And by adding this circuit to our converter, we're able to apply DDRCC in a scalable way. Uh, previously, we had demonstrated at low voltage and low current where we could simply scale the entire zero to I short circuit current into the ADC, and we could just simply scale the voltage into the ADC. Uh, again, as, we, as, we, as the panel power rises, as the DC magnitude of the voltage and current increases, that approach just was not effective for the reasons I showed you before. But we applied this circuit, and we're able to get uh, quick convergence. Um, the 90.3% 90, 90 convergence or tracking efficiency that we were able to get for DDC, DDRCC using this implementation uh, stands in contrast to the 97.4 that we would get for undithered perturb and observe. And we're able to accomplish this maximum PowerPoint tracking technique much faster than an undithered, um, no, pardon me, at about the same rate as undithered perturb and observe, possibly a little bit faster but we're able to uh, track the maximum point, power point much faster than we were, we would be able to if we used a dithered perturb and observe. So uh, with that, um, basically what did we accomplish? We accomplished high PWM re resolution using an eight megahertz microcontroller. And we were able to accomplish uh, great maximum power point tracking with this dithered uh, windowed Excuse me, with this dithered approach, um, the windowed, windowed measurement allowed us to scale the, the, the theoretical, basically, if you will, theoretical implementation of DDRCC that we were able to demonstrate before, where we just had a very small panel. Uh, this shows that using a windowed measurement technique, we're able to scale that up to a full standard panel power. Um, the windowed measurements can also be applied to other, for instance, perturb and observe uh, maximum power point tracking techniques, and it will be easier. So this windowed measurement technique may be, may be even more helpful in, in less aggressive MPP tracking techniques. And again, like I showed you, the hardware requirements are pretty minimal because we already need to multiply or amplify the current sense resistor voltage. So we're already going to have an op amp on the converter. 
And they often come in quad packs, so we use a couple more of them, and we're able to window and measure that signal with fairly high precision. So thank you for your time. I just wonder if there's any questions at this point. Srikant. Yeah, These are adjacent native duty ratios. Okay. So this is, you know, one thirty second and two thirty second in this app in this instance. So these are those are the closest we can get using a na the native PWM hardware. Okay. So but you effectively move out of the curve a little bit and then switch. both waves would move out of the, the nominal optimal value, right? So we change one high duty ratio would correspond to a point on the one side, the other duty ratio because on the peak peak Problem, uh, let's say uh, the optimal point is at C, uh -huh. and then you move to the point uh, when you're closer to uh, the optimal point. On the right side, it could be more damaging than on the left side, right? You're, you're, you drop more power on the right side, whereas you drop only less power on the low side. So, do you think you can exploit that fact when you design the high and the low duty ratio, or would that not be a concern at all? I have to think about it a little bit, but theoretically, what we want to do is we want to ripple back and forth across the maximum power point. We want the maximum power point to occur over the ripple. Whether we could split that ripple up, maybe, but I think I don't know if it would be really worth it. Because when you actually start tracking the maximum power point, you know, in the milliamp range, this is rather flat in some from some perspective. So, yeah. No. So which which the time scale for going up to maximum power point Oh the is um is there. Yeah. This is the DC array under okay. the bench upstairs. The only thing I have a question about, so the window is following it too, right? So Correct. what happens when they have really fast transients and, you know, it's a cloudy day and the clouds dropping down, so everything's moving up and down, so your window has to follow your current. So is that a problem for you, or is it going to be even faster? Well, it, it's changing really quickly. Yeah, you could argue that that's the... You know that's why this doesn't go nearly straight up, um, because because when the current leaves the window, the microcontroller has to stop and reevaluate and shift this window up. So, so it's kind of it's kind of iterative, and it, it just shifts up until it re achieves a windowed measurement, and then it evaluates the DDRCC. It just reevaluate, correct? Andrew. When you say tracking efficiency of uh, DDRC versus PNO, um, mm -hmm. are you using dithering on uh, perturb and observe, or are you using the discrete value? That, that's a really good point. I should put that in here. This is um, under there. This is discrete values of duty ratio. Okay. And so, so you're, both, you're kind of getting both effects there, the tracking correct. and the, the dithering effect. So the PNO dithered would be here, no question about it. But our update speed would be slower. I guess the advantage would be if you were changing a lot, if you had a really cloudy data or something going across, you might see a little bit of a difference. Correct. Like Correct. Or mobile applications or wearable PV cells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> PV cell headbands. <laughs> so, is that it? Okay, Troy. Uh, how does like, the window DC improvement scale with I think that would go back to the quality of the ADC itself and the quality of the circuit layout. I think that's what would be more dependent on. Theoretically, I, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. 
Well, but you have to consider the relative value of the noise compared to the native resolution of the ADC. So if under this under these noise conditions, the the noise for the noise, the you know, minimum uh, realistically achievable resolution may be the same with a 12-bit ADC as 10-bit AC, um, depending on how that worked out. So you, I'd have to think about that a little bit more, but you could end up in the same place. I'm not totally sure. Andrew seems to be shaking his head, so that's probably a good sign at the <laughs> National Instruments guy. Or if you could oversample, it, obviously that helps, but we can't oversample here. So, yeah. well, thank you for your time. Second speaker today is Shibin Qing. Shibin received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Huazhong University of Science and Technology in 2012. He's currently a master's student at the University of Illinois with Professor Palawa, and his research interest is in power electronics and photovoltaic applications. Uh, thank you very much, Samin. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk about the work we have done um, on merging differential power processing with uh, microinverter. And uh, to my knowledge, this is actually the first uh, dynamic demonstration of DPP uh, control working together um, with a microinverter. And in this presentation, um, I'm going to introduce uh, what is DPP and how it works, uh, and how do we control it, and the implement implementation challenges we have met, and our solutions. And also, I'm going to show some experimental results that verify the effectiveness of this DPP approach. Um, so to start with, um, in PV system, well, co conventionally, uh, modules are often connected in series um, and uh, send power through a central inverter to the power grid. But series connected PV module um, has well-known uh, mismatch problem uh, due to like um, various reasons. Um, and the current mismatch exists between different modules and even between different submodules within one uh, PV module uh, like this. And this mismatch is especially uh, severe in uh, residential application where you have a more uh, complicated environment. And to um, Help, uh, solving, uh, help solving this uh, mismatch problem, people have developed um, a macroinverter, which interface uh, each individual PV module and perform a module level maximum power interacting. Um, and it has become, macroinverter has become the dominant solution in um, residential application. But as I just, as I just said, um, the current configuration of macroinverter does not compensate for mismatch between some modules within one PV module. Um, and as, uh, and it, it can be especially um, uh, severe in residential application. So here I'm just showing an example in which you have one PV module of three submodules, and each one is receiving 
uh, different uh, irradiance, and that's pr producing different uh, power. So the power versus voltage characteristic look like this. You know, they have their own characteristic, and they have their own optimal point. And to the macro inverter here, this PV module characteristic actually look like this line. So the macro inverter cannot extract the optimal power from uh, each submodule, and it can actually be trapped. The maximum problem tracking algorithm of the macro inverter can actually be trapped uh, in the local maximum. I'm going to show an example later uh, to illustrate this point. So uh, how are we going to solve the mismatch problem between submodules? Uh, I think one obvious solution is that we can take macro inverter to submodule level, but uh, to the best of my knowledge, no one um, has ever uh, done that because the dollar per watt cost will be very prohibitive. So um, for cost reason, that's um, not a solution. And a more viable solution um, nowadays is DC optimizer, which I'm uh, showing here. So basically, DC optimizer is inserted between each submodule and the entire uh, string to ensure that um, DC optimizer can perform submodule level maximum power interacting. And here I'm showing an excellent example um, of uh, submodule level DC optimizer. But the problem with DC optimizer is that each DC optimizer has to process the full power of each submodule. So it will be, um, it, it will have a relatively high power rating requirement, and it will actually limit the the DC uh, optimizer will actually limit the system efficiency. And we'll show an example later. But the question is, can we overcome this limitation and do better? And the answer is yes. And this can be done by differential power processing. Um, so uh, there are many different variations of uh, DPP architecture uh, that has been proposed. And you are encouraged to read the paper for more reference. But um, which, what I'm showing here is uh, element to element structure, which uh, we believe is the uh, most feasible solution for micro inverter. So here, each DPP, uh, each DPP converter <laughs> is configured as a bi directional back boost converter. And uh, the bulk power that is common to all PV submodules actually goes to the macro inverter directly uh, without any intermediate conversion. And uh, the DC to DC converter only process the power mismatch, which is typically very small compared to the full power. And uh, because of that, uh, DPP uh, is actually advantageous over DC optimizer in terms of efficiency, converter rating, and ease of e integration. And um, here is an example to illustrate that point. So assume we have a PV module with three submodules, and each is receiving uh, different in irradiance and is generating different power. So there is a mismatch. So if we use DC optimizer solution, and we assume a 95% efficient DC optimizer, um, as you can see here, because each DPP, uh, each DC to DC uh, converter is consuming, is processing the full power. So even you only have 5% loss, the overall um, like power loss penalty is still significant. But uh, if we process the same power, uh, the same uh, irradiance condition with differential power processing, and because each converter is actually processing the differential power, which is relatively small, so even if we assume a much less efficient converter, which is 85% in this case, we are still getting like a much smaller power loss in the end. So um, as I mentioned before, for DPP system, the system efficiency is fundamentally limited by the DC to DC converter efficiency, which is exactly 90, uh, 95%. But for DPP system, these two efficiency are decoupled. And we can achieve um, higher efficiency, where, uh, even with less efficient converter. So um, that's a benefit. And of course, each converter can be rated at a much lower, uh, much smaller uh, power rating. 
And another point is that DPP is uh, relatively easy to integrate into the existing uh, PV module design because to, in, to uh, insert DC optimizer, you have to break the internal connection of uh, a PV module and uh, put the DC optimizer, which require a lot of uh, work actually. But for DPP converter, you can simply attach them in parallel, um, which is shown here. So you don't really need to alternate any existing panel or microinverter design. Um, so DPP is good, but um, excuse me. So DPP is good, but how does it work uh, exactly, and how can we actually control it to uh, exploit all the benefits it can offer? So um, here, the well, uh, sorry, the conventional. Um, well, well, I mean, the commercial microinverter typically run a voltage reference per turbine observed um, algorithm, which means it will regulate the string uh, voltage. And for DPP converters, they can adjust their own duty ratio to enforce a certain voltage ratio between neighboring converters. So the relation um, of voltage and duty ratio is actually shown here. So deep, this DPP system is actually governed by these three equations. So for each insulation uh, irradiance condition, each uh, submodule has its own maximum power point voltage. Uh, let's assume it's V1, V2, and V3 star. And this will translate to a unique combination of duty ratio and module voltage. And the goal of uh, this DPP maximum power point tracking control is to find this unique combination. And how can we do that? Um, so the power output of a module is simply the power voltage multiplied the, the power current, multiplied by the power current. And because, as we said, microinverter is actually regulating this voltage, and we can make the control loop for DPP converter very fast compared to the microinverter, such that uh, for DPP converter, this VM can be viewed as temporarily fixed by the microinverter. Then uh, the only task of DPP converter is uh, to maximize the string current, which is the um, uh, listed as the control objective here. And uh, uh, we can take a look at the timeline uh, of this control. So once in a while, the microinverter will update the module voltage, um, and in between, DPP converter can operate really fast to maximize the string current. And uh, if they work together properly, and the module power can actually be maximized. And um, for DPP converter specifically, um, for any fixed module voltage, we can visualize the module current as a function of the duty ratio here. So as you can see in this plot, so um, module current is a nice concave function of the duty ratio. So if we apply a simple perturb and observe method, or, or say like Q-climbing method, it's guaranteed that we can find the optimal point. But the only remaining problem um, in this control method is that if you read this uh, plot carefully, uh, near the optimal point, the curve, the surface, is actually very flat, which means for a certain uh, duty ratio perturbation, the changing string current can be quite small. And it's going to be an implementation challenge um, for us to how do we sense that small current change. And uh, this is where um, I actually uh, borrow some idea from, from Chris. Um, we have a, a sensing, we have a win moving window technique that can help us sense small current change. So, uh, that conventionally, when we want to measure current, we typically dire uh, directly scale the current signal to fit it into the 3.3 volt or 2.5 volt ADC, uh, which have a limited resolution. So in this case, uh, because we are limited by the 0, to zero amp to 5 amp uh, current range um, coming out of from the PV module, so if we scale it directly, 
one microamp change will only result in 0 0.7 millivolt, uh, one milliamp change will only will result in 0 0.7 millivolt change in ADC input, and will only result in 0 0.82 effective ADC value, which is quite you know too small. The typically the the change due to a, a duty ratio perturbation is about 20 milliamp, which will translate into only 16 bit ADC. And if you are familiar with microinverter ADC, so uh, typically it's coupled with uh, quite significant noise. So 16 um, bit ADC in the 40,000 um, range is not enough, it's not you know, large enough to determine the relative current change. So what we do is that we basically scale the current first and we subtract a uh, moving bias to remove the large DC component from the current and we only amplify the relatively small current change because in perturbant observe method, we only care about the relative change. We don't really care about the absolute value. So um, uh, for, for a more complete detail, you are encouraged to read the paper. But what we uh, end up achieving is that after applying this technique, 20 milli, uh, mag, a milliamp change will actually result in 320 um, effective ADC value which is uh, which can be picked up easily by um, the microinverter ADC, and for a more complete um, analysis on this moving window technique, you are encouraged to listen to Chris' presentation, um, uh, which is Tuesday session T34. And to summarize, the control procedure is that basically, um, before each iteration, uh, we adjust the voltage bias to center the uh, current signal in the middle of ADC range. And we, we take the measurement, we perturb the duty ratio, and we measure the current again. And only, we only care about the relative change. And we decide the direction we, uh, of duty ratio we want to go in next step. So it will look like this. It will start from a random initial point and climb to the optimal point. Um, so uh, here uh, next is about like how we implement this um, control algorithm. So basically what we have uh, done is that we integrate two DPB converter and, and one microcontroller in one piece of uh, PCB and we use a relatively low cost um, passive uh, capacitor diode level shifting circuit to help reduce the cost and size. Um, and here are just specification of this converter. And the highlight, uh, the nice thing is that uh, we do achieve a relatively small circuit footprint, which goes right into the uh, microinverter junction box. So um, it will offer um, some uh, benefit in terms of cost. Uh, I will just skip this. So uh, this is our experimental setup. So we basically take a commercial off-the-shelf microinverter from, from SolarBridge, um, and we put a uh, AC power source to simulate the grid because this microinverter won't operate unless we provide a great grid reference. And we also use uh, a PV uh, emulate, emulator, um, which actually use the real uh, PV hardware to preserve the real dynamic um, of uh, each submodule. So uh, for more, more details about this emulating technique, uh, you can read this paper shown here. But uh, this is basically our experimental setup. And here is the experimental result. So as I mentioned before, macroinverter can actually be trapped in the local maximum, which is exactly uh, happening here. So when we have mismatch between uh, submodules, uh, without BVP turning on, the uh, macroinverter perturbant observe uh, algorithm actually stuck in this local maximum. And we are plotting the real-time uh, power output from uh, the macro uh, controller. So as you can see, once we turn on the DVP, it actually uh, go up to uh, the optimal point exactly. So DVP does help a microinverter to extract the optimal power uh, from the system. So here is just showing um, 
showing here is for different situations, the, uh, uh, the evolution of uh, duty ratio. So uh, we start from a random initial point and they quickly converge to the optimal value. Um, for every one second, the macro inverter will update its voltage reference. So here, approximately every one second, you can see there's a change in operating point of the DPV converter. So the, the, the timeline, the, the operation of these two uh, uh, control loop actually align well with each other. And I do want to uh, mention that the update of microinverter is actually faster in practice than one uh, second. And we are slowing down um, the microinverter just to, for data acquisition purpose. And um, the last uh, point of the experimental result is that I want to show you um, the you know, quantized benefit of this DPP approach. So for different uh, irradiance condition, if we, um, if we do, um, we use macroinverter without DPP, and these are the potential power loss due to the, um, you know, um, like, you know, macroinverter unable to track the optimal point. But once we turn on um, the DPP, we actually reduce the power loss, potential power loss by um, about 20 times. So um, it does improve the benefit of uh, merging DPP with macroinverter. So uh, here is my concluding remark. So uh, DPP is a potential low cost solution to um, compensate PV module mismatch uh, uh, within, uh, between different submodules. And this is the first um, the working uh, dynamic demonstration that DBP and macroinverter can work together. And um, so uh, for future work, even more if efficiency improvement and cost reduction can actually be achieved by integrating DBP and the macroinverter together. Um, and uh, at last, I do want to thank uh, John and Chris and RPE for paying, paying my tuition. And, and um, I'm happy to take any question you have now. Thank you. Okay, no question, good. Message well received, thank you. Uh -huh. well, sorry, what do you mean? Like, you mean this one? Uh, yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's po possible. Well, oh, well, that one is because once, like, the, uh, the, all this uh, gate driver and everything won't turn on until you have 10 volt. So once it goes, you know, 10 volt, everything turn on and it's consuming a little bit power to actually pull the, the power curve down. So I, I think it's not very likely because once you go to this low value, it will just turn off the DBP automatically. So you will have a smooth curve again. So you're really getting the power, it's just going away. If you're operating a little bit above that, they're just going to DBP. Is that correct? Sorry, what do you mean? So the tip is that you're not turning on, and uh -huh. you have losses. Yeah, I'm using a I'm using a, a linear regulator to power the gate driver, so it's probably not very efficient. And it's the, uh, well, it's right before it's right before the macro inverter. Yes, yes. The DBB power DB actually draw power from the panel. Yeah, and so also, it's still, like, the is still clear. yeah, it's it's not very likely you will operate at 10 volt range because I think in that case, a uh, macro inverter will probably just turn off itself because because you know it's it has some safety like you know check before it turn on. So it's like that's actually introduced by TPP, and well, that's a very good point actually. Yeah, very sharp eye. Thank you. <laughs> Oh.
Okay, okay. Thank you very much.